ahead, open up your MacBook. Turn it on. And uh, we're going to build apps today. At least three of them, I'm hoping. Well, two of them. Well, okay, we're going to get through at least one of them today. We're going to build something from scratch. Uh, so instead of sharing your PowerPoints, instead of going through, we're going to take tutorial, a tutorial approach to this. The first one we're going to build, I'm kind of going to do it on the fly without like following step by step. Then as we go through some of the more complicated ones, in order for me to remember the tutorial, I got to go follow through some steps. But right now we're just going to kind of just build from scratch and we'll see how things work. So you should have your system set up and ready to go if you're going to do this. So go ahead and create a new Xcode project. We're building uh, our first one, uh, well our first official one. It's going to be Hello World, um, you know, with a twist. Definitely. Um, and so we're going to select a single view application. So after you've make sure that up here on the left hand side where it says iOS, that you have iOS application clicked. If you have it down here, you're going to have different options over here. So that's a give, dead giveaway right there. And as I'm going through this, I'm going to assume you guys are following along. If someone's stuck, like you're like, wait a minute, where's that single view? I can't find it. And I'm going too fast. Just raise your hand. So, and then what I'll do is I'll do, we'll just pause momentarily. I'll walk over and help you, and then come back. So it's not. I'm not like stuck right here, but I'm recording right here. So it's. I usually stand right here, but I can go out and help you. Um, I just need to know where to go. Okay. So click on application. Click on single view application. Oh, we have a. We, my class. Okay. Uh, what did you miss last week? Um, well, do you have a MacBook? You yeah. didn't miss anything. No, I, <laughs> I told everyone to go out and buy a MacBook. And I told everyone to install Xcode. Did you install Xcode? No, I did not do that. This is my first class. So. All right. I'm only going to do this one time. This is for the benefit of those people who weren't here last time. This program you're looking at is called Xcode. Click on the little apple up here in the left-hand corner of your Mac. And uh, any version of your Mac would work. Go into Software Update. Over in the left hand, excuse me, over in the right hand side, type in Xcode. Press return. This is the program here, this one over here on the left hand side of the screen. It says Xcode. It's got a little blue kind of square thing with a hammer on it. If it says installed, don't install it. It's already installed on your computer. If it says install or um, purchase or I don't know actually it should say free on it actually it is free don't pay for it you gotta download that unfortunately well actually fortunately I'm recording all of this unfortunately <laughs> you have to download and install Xcode before you can start but fortunately you can come back and pick it up and while you're downloading you can just listen to me and watch along anybody else have any initial before we get started any initial questions or problems or concerns or anything no? Okay, good. <coughs> and I am working on, uh, by the way, it doesn't really matter. I'm not on Maverick, although I have tended to upgrade because I've heard some things about some stuff that was fixed that I didn't like. So, But I'm still on Mountain Lion. I might upgrade, but I haven't upgraded yet. It doesn't matter because Xcode looks the same. So, However, your Xcode version might look different than this. If it does, you'll have to find, this is the current version, you'll have to find a, a solution. Or find the options where they're located in the older version. Okay, so click on single view application. It says number one on it. And then click on next. And then give your app a name where it says product name. Um, so I'm going to call this our first app. Eh, there we go, first app. And uh, I put it all in one name with no spaces. Don't put any spaces in there. Just give it a name. And I use the camel case where I've got the capital F, capital A. So... Uh, just keep that in mind. It's kind of a nice naming convention. Under organizational name, whatever you put in here is going to show up every time you make a new app. So I put in I2 just because that's where we're at. It doesn't really matter. You can put in your name. You can put anything you want. Um, most people would put their name in there. Um, and then under company identifier, you can actually leave a blank or you can put in a back, uh, like itu.edu or something. <clears throat> so. And then under class prefix, I never use it. I just leave it blank, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and then on the device, let's go for iPhone today. Yeah? Yes. 
Uh, hold on one second, and let me pause for a second. So yes, as we discovered, you have to fill out all of the information, except for the class prefix. You don't need that. So are we good to move forward? OK, good. Click on Next, and we're moving forward. <clears throat> now I'm putting mine on the desktop. I'd put yours in some place where you want to keep it. It doesn't really matter where you put it. You can always move it around. If you put it on the desktop, you'll find it. If you put it in my documents, it's probably more logical. Find your location. Click on your location. We don't need the source code to create a Git repository on my Mac or any other thing. Uh, so unselect the Git repository, and then uh, you'll save yourself a little bit of disk space, a little bit. Uh, I'll talk about Git later on. It's a uh, open source utilities, I mean, repository where you can pull things out, put the stuff in. So we're not going to get that far right now, though. Now, you'll notice on the top, there's usually a blue bar thing that goes across and the project gets ready. We are now sort of uh, ready to go. And uh, what I'm going to do is start with the GUI. So in the GUI, we have this thing called main.storyboard. So on the left-hand side over here, on the left-hand side, click on main.storyboard. You get a little screen that looks like this that comes up. And when you click on it, it gets blue. And it moves when it's blue. Why do you want to move it? You don't have to move it. I like to move it so I can make it easier for you to see what I'm doing with it. And um, <coughs> this is, uh, by default, this is our view controller. So we work with what's called model view controller. Yes? If it doesn't move, click it. So like, like right now, it's not moving. I'm like clicking around it. It's not doing anything. You could click on the bottom piece. See so the little black bar on the bottom? It's a little trick. If you want to move it, like if it's like partially in your view, if you click on the bottom piece, it moves it every time. So yeah. Otherwise, I have a tendency. I don't like to click down here for some reason, but that's the fail-safe kind of way of doing it. So let me talk about Mono View Controller for a few minutes. This is a view controller. Well, it's a view controller. We have one. It's called here. It's called viewcontroller.h. So Objective C. We have two files that go with each object, a .h and a .m. The .h file is the interface. .m file is the implementation of the interface. Just like C++ where there's a .h and a .c++ file. Not like Java. Java only has a .java file. So. Um, in our implementation, we have an object. Model view controller, we have three different objects. We got a view, we got a model, and we got a controller. Model, the way to think about model, it's a data model. So don't call it a data model because it's not called a data model. But mentally insert the word data in there and you'll remember what the model is. It holds the data. <laughs> Why they call it data? Well, data is. It does more than just that, but right now we're going to think of it like a data model. <clears throat> the controller controls the view. We don't actually have a view file. Instead, we have a storyboard file. It's called main.storyboard. In the old days, it used to be called XIB for Xcode Interface Builder. IB stands for Interface Builder and then X for Xcode. And then they took Xcode Interface Builder away, and then they called it Storyboard. We call it storyboard. They call it storyboard because we can have more than one view. And we're going to see later in the course, we're going to add multiple views to this. And we tie all the views together, and it kind of creates a storyboard. That's where the storyboard sort of comes into place. In older versions of Xcode, like maybe one version past, you had the option of selecting XIB files or storyboard. I'm only going to use storyboard in this class because that's all that's supported in 5 and above. So, I mean, we can, we, well, I shouldn't say that. By default, that's what's supported. We can still use XIBs, and we will. But by default, I think we should switch over to Storyboard, because that's what everybody else is doing in industry. So I'm not going to teach you from an XIB interface. But we'll be using those, so you're not going to miss out on anything. We're going to do things the modern way. We also don't have to worry about things like ARC, Automatic Reference Counting. That's been taken out. So if you have an older version, select ARC if you're using an old version of Xcode, because you're going to need ARC checked. It's not checked. This is turned on by default. Um, I'll get into ARC later on in the course. It's uh, memory management. Actually, we'll see some of it today as well. But. So app delegate is our data. It's also the traffic, the traffic cop for the app. Everything that loads for the app, the configuration is an app delegate. 
So it's the delegate that controls the app. It actually serves as our model. So it's our data model as well. Our main storyboard is our view. And our view controller, well, that's our view control. That's our controller. What does the controller do? It controls the view. <laughs> so, um, and seriously, that's the best way I can describe it. It's all of the information that goes into the view. So all the labels, the buttons, and everything are all known in the view controller. And we put all that stuff in the view. We wire it to the view controller. And then we can tell the app delegate that this is part of the app, and that's part of the app, and use this window, and use that view. We're going to go with the defaults today, or actually this week we're on the defaults for the app delegate. So I'm not going to change that around very much. Uh, but we will be adding a lot of stuff to the storyboard and then connecting it to the view. So what I'm trying to do is kind of give you the layout of what it is we're looking at. All the other stuff over here, we got one thing that says like supporting files. Don't ever touch this stuff. You don't need it. You don't, you don't, for, for the purposes of this course, you'll never touch anything except for what's right here in the main folder. And this is going to be our model view controller. That's all we're going to work with. So these uh, test cases over here, don't worry about it. It's for unit testing. We'll go through that later in the course. Frameworks, well, these are all the foundation classes, the core graphics, all of the things we need for the iPhone. We, we will add some stuff to it later on in the course, but <coughs> right now, just, we're just going to leave it alone. Products. Interesting thing is there's our app, but it doesn't work. Not like Android where we can drag that out and install it onto a phone. You can. You can hack it, but it's not easy. So instead, we run things through the emulator. In a couple weeks, I'll show you the phone, and I'll show you how to, or I'll, I'll take an iPad. I have an iPad mini I'll hook up, and we'll see how that works with a device. But you can't pull the files off, although this is a working executable file right here, first app, um, first, first app dot app, app. If you're familiar with iOS, you know everything's got app on the end of it. It is actually the finished product, it's the binary, but it doesn't install. There's a signature on it that needs to be authenticated with the Apple Store in order for it to install. Long story short, don't, I mean, you'll spend too much time trying to figure out how to make it work the wrong way. It's easier to just make it work the right way. I'm going to show you the right way on the real device in a couple weeks. I'm not going to show that to you today. So. Uh, yes? <coughs> so if uh, we cannot install this... Uh, we have an emulator. You, we don't need... You, you can get by the entire course of that with a device either. You don't need a device. We're going to run it on the emulator. And the emulators for iOS work great. So we don't have to worry about it. Alright, so let's start building our app. Um, so... On the model view controllers, everything's separated out into those three different components. I think the fun part's the view, so I always start with the view. I work with the view, dress it up, put the stuff on there that I want, wire it to the controller, and then make any model changes that are necessary. We're not going to make any model changes today. We're not going to work with that. We're just going to work with the view, and we're going to work with the view controller today, so we can understand how that works. So we're going to start with the storyboard, which is the view component. So go ahead and click on the storyboard, it says main.storyboard. If you selected a universal app type, you have two storyboards. One for iPad, one for iPhone. If you did that, pick one you like. I don't care which one you're doing it. I'm going to use iPhone, so I got the iPhone one going on here. Now, as I mentioned the last time, <coughs> we have these three little buttons over here, these three little things. When it's blue, it means it's on. When it's black, it's off. So if I clicked in the middle over here, I see this bottom piece coming up. And I click over here and I see the side piece coming in. Occasionally this stuff will go away because you'll click on something and it'll all go away. When it goes away and you want to find it, it's probably going to be all black. Like here's one's black, here's this one's black, and that one's black. Everything went away. Where did everything go? <laughs> then click on the pieces and bring it back. It's the only way you can, well, you can use the menu items, but this is the easiest way of doing it. On the second set over here, we're, we're only going to be using this one here. This guy I call the tuxedo icon. The tuxedo icon is the only one that you're really, it's the one in the middle. And I'll point it out when we use it. This is the one that's going to link us with the code. So it brings up another little window. So the little window comes up here. <coughs> I take the window away initially. <coughs> oh, there goes the cough. Um, but uh, you can leave the window here. You can leave it. You can take it away. 
Mine's not going away. I actually have to go like this in order to get it away, it looks like. Um, because we have one at a time. So it's either going to be here, it's going to be here, or it's going to be here. This one doesn't make any sense to me. So probably, you know, this one here is pretty good. So the one on the left here gives us our file list over here. Whatever we click on the file list shows up in the middle. Okay. So let's dress this up a little bit. So what we're going to do is make a hello world. Um, I'm going to put a label. Let's put a couple labels on there with a couple buttons. When we click on the buttons, it changes what's on the label. How does that sound? And then we'll add some more stuff to it. We could put an input box in there next and stuff. Uh, but let's get at least to the hello world part. And then I can show you Xcode. I mean, uh, excuse me, Objective-C as well. <coughs> so <clears throat> all of my apps have green backgrounds. So I must change the background to green. You can change your background to anything you want. Um, so over here on the right hand side, and you can pull this over here and make it bigger if you want, but it doesn't get bigger, it just makes it wider. Um, <clears throat> over here it says background. These are called properties or attributes. And this window is called the attribute inspector. So we're, the, we're doing the attribute inspector where we're inspecting the attributes of this over here. If I click on this item over here, I get a view controller that pops up because this one is a view controller. On the view controller I can change attributes. As an example the background color where it says white if I click on it I can change it to green. So now I have a green background. What else can I do to it? Well I can change the full scale mode or redraw mode. Oh, let's just leave it on the view on full scale mode. <coughs> I can select different characteristics for the sketching don't really change anything yet. I wouldn't mess around too much until you know what you're doing. Um, but you could possibly change the background color if you wanted to. Now the items over here, because I've been clicking on view controller, by default I have view controller selected. What they don't tell you is down, everything's all in here together. This little box that's supposed to be an object, it says show the object library shows up. So a little trick, if you're lost and you don't know what you're doing, for example, I don't know what this thing is over here. If I put my mouse over this little thing, it says show the attribute inspector. And, oh, I'm in the attribute inspector. Are you reading in some instruction? And it says show the identity inspector. Oh, there's the identity inspector. So if I click on this button here, I see the identity inspector. And then I see the attribute inspector. We got about a dozen or so different windows that are all nested in the same section of the screen. So that's where the most confusing part comes in with Xcode. It's knowing what screen you're in and where to find what you're looking for. So it ends up happening in the first couple weeks of this class is people go, how can I don't see that window? I don't see those options. So all you have to do, the easy thing is just to raise your hand and go, I don't see those options. And then I'll uh, click on this little guy right here. It says attribute inspector. And then we'll get you to those options. Because <clears throat> it's very common for you not to see what's on my screen. Okay. If you go down to the bottom, there's a little bitty search thing on the bottom. Yes? You don't see those options. Perfect. I love that. Okay, hold on one second. Let's get you to those options. And for those people who have already lost their patience, it does actually take a little bit of uptime in the beginning. We go a little slower, then we go faster. So, uh, For those people who found the color wheel, if I clicked on here and I changed it, but I didn't show you this little color wheel, sometimes you'll see a different GUI depending upon your settings. What's, what's happened is that on my computer, I have things set the way I want it. You can adjust your properties a little bit, adjust your settings. In fact, this one doesn't even come up. In fact, you can play around with the menu items and adjust the view any way you want. Some people get rid of this on the top. I like the top piece. But you can get rid of the top menu bar. You can change all sorts of things around. So if your screen doesn't look like my screen, don't worry about it. If you can't find what you're supposed to be finding, then you raise your hand and let me know. Okay, so <clears throat> going back to the object browser down here, if you put your mouse over here, it says show object library. If you have items that look like this down here on the bottom of the screen, you're in good shape. This is what we want. If you have items that look like this, you're in the wrong, wrong submenu. Uh, because this one here, if you have your mouse over, says that you're in the show file template library. We don't want that. And then we have the show source code snippet library. We don't want that one. And then here's the one we really want. It's the object library. 
And the, the one on the left over here is the media library. We don't actually have any media in here. So click on the object library if you don't click on there already. It is the default. If you want to raise this up, you can raise it up. The only problem is then it stays up. So I like to leave mine on the bottom. Unfortunately, they put the search bar way on the bottom. It's like on the bottom of the screen. And so if you're your things down here, your trays down here. <laughs> My tray comes up half the time every time I come down here. Uh, but in any case, I'm going to type a label, L-A-B-E-L, -E and it says label that comes up. And uh, if you were here last time, we did this part actually. Drag a label. Um, put two labels. Let's put two labels on the uh, on the interface because what we're trying to do is get the, the connectivity to work. So grab a couple labels, stick it on here, and uh, if you click on the label, you'll see in the right-hand side over here in the Attribute Inspector all the properties for the label that can be changed. As an example, we have a text property, and we can put the number of lines. Here we have one, and we can enable it or highlight it, truncate it, do a bunch of stuff to it. Um, so right now the label text, which is plain text, says label on it. I can actually change the label over here and put one, I'm going to put here thing one, thing one, and then I see thing one, and then I see dot, dot, dot because it's too small. So I'm going to make thing one a little bit bigger. So we'll do a cat and a hat theme here with thing one and thing one and thing two. <coughs> so I'm making my labels a little bigger. If you don't want to change it over here, if you don't want to change the text over here, you can change it right on the GUI. So I can just double click on it and go thing two. And now I'm making this bigger because we're going to change the label programmatically. So I want to make sure I, whatever I change fits in here. <coughs> Excuse me. And then over here where it says that the font is the system font, if you click on the little T next to it, it brings up a little window that says font. And you can change the font like body font, headline. I'm going to leave it on system font, but I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. I'm going to change the size. I'm just going to type the size in, actually. I'm going to change it to 25. Why not? It's pretty good. So now I have a bigger font on the screen. I don't want to change it that way. I can use the arrows and change it to 25 this way. Yeah? Oh, okay. Hold on one second. Oh. <coughs> An interesting question came up. on. Um, and maybe I'll just point this out because I'm not sure I pointed it out yet. I saved my app onto my desktop, and I called it first app. So I know this is the folder. Everything for the app is all self-contained in the folder. And these are all the subfolders. So where it says first app, this is the folder that has the same files in it, same format, same structure as what's over on the left-hand side in Xcode. So if I go back into Xcode, this, all this, this is just the representation. It's like the file menu, representation of what's in that folder. doesn't matter where you put the folder. I can move the folder all over the place, and I can open up the project, and it just opens up the subfolders inside of it. So it's not like a Windows path kind of restricted kind of thing. Not like um, if you're familiar with Eclipse, it's not like, like that. Yeah, Eclipse, you move it, and you're in trouble. This, you move it all the way where it doesn't really matter. Okay, so let's move on. So now down here, take and backspace over label, remove that. You don't even have to search. I'm, I like to search. You don't even have to. You can actually just scroll through here if you want. But next, let's put a couple buttons on here. So we'll go button one, button two. So I'm going to take here and just pick, pick the plain old button. You can pick any type you want. So I'm just going to put a button right here. And then I'm going to put a button right here. So I drag two buttons over. Let's put an image on one of these buttons so we can see what the image looks like. So here's what we're going to do. So on this one here, I'm just going to call this one. I'm going to double click on it call this one button one. Oops, I just put one here. Button, button one. And uh, let's, uh, I'm going to make the font a little bit bigger because you guys are sitting in the back. I'm going to put the font on 25. And uh, you can change different properties. When you click on the button, the attribute inspector over here changes. What do we get? Uh, we, get we can do different types of buttons. We can do, the, you know, we can change the color of the text. Well, I'm going to change color. I'm going to make this one here. It's going to have red text on it. Let's make it purple. Some purple text on the button. Change all the attributes. 
So let's say we want to get fancy in here. We want an image for the button. Let's put an image on one of these buttons. So we need to find an image. So I'm going to just actually just pull up a web browser. I'm going to go to, I'm going to pull up Firefox. And uh, I'm just going to pick an image off the internet and download it. And I'm not caring about copyright. So you should care about copyright though. So don't do, do, do as I say, not as I do or something. And what I'm, what I'm saying is I'm going to pull something off the internet and I'm going to stick it in my app. Technically, probably shouldn't do that. But this is for educational purposes. We're not redistributing this app. I'm not stealing someone's graphic. However, you shouldn't be stealing people's graphics. However, there's a bunch of free images and you can go out and look for it. I'm not going to pay attention to that and I'm not going to look for it right now. So, with that disclaimer, <laughs> I had somebody once tell me, oh, you should tell your students they shouldn't do that. So, uh, that's for that person. Okay, so I'm going to put one here. I'm going to go here. Oh, I don't know. I'm just going to type something in. Purple, purple bear dot PNG. I don't know if there's a purple bear out there or not. Pick an image. I'm just going to pick any image, actually. And if I search on this, oh, look at that. We do have purple bears. I can click on the images. For, for those people who don't know, you can click on images in Google. And you can see all a bunch of images. Like, there's a purple bear. I like this purple bear. So I'm going to click on this purple bear. And uh, I'm going to save the purple bear to my desktop. And uh, you can put JPEGs. This one here, if I save this one, this one is actually a PNG, I think. No, it's a JPEG. So this is a good example, actually. So I'm going to call this P-Bear. And I'll just show you. You can do a JPEG or a PNG. Uh, what did I call it? P-Bear. There's a P-Bear. Let me pick another one just in case. Um, here, I'm going, to, I'm going to put in here a purple frog. frog. Let's see what happens if I can get a purple frog. Why does it have to be purple? Maybe I should go green. Maybe I should just go frog. I don't think there's any purple frogs out there. Okay, hold on. Uh, here's a, oh, this is cool. I like these frogs. So I'm going to go to image. And uh, here's a cool looking frog. I'm looking for a PNG file. Ah, that's a PNG file. How do I know it's a PNG file? You can't see it on your screen, but there's like a little boxes here. It means the background is clear. The reason why I'm doing this is I want to show you what, what, what effect this does on your button. So if you want like a square button or one that has a background, you can do that. Or you can do this one where you're going to see a transparent background. So this one here has got a bunch. You can't see it on the transparency here, but I can see it on my computer. You can see it probably on your computer. A bunch of gray and white square boxes in the background. I know it's a PNG and I know it's got, that's how I can tell that it's got, uh, <coughs> it has transparent background. So I'm going to go save image as and see it comes up frog.png. I'm saving the images right now to my desktop. You want a quickie way of finding it, just type in frog.png or frog space.png. Click, click on Google Images. Get yourself a frog if you want a frog. Okay, so uh, does anyone need more time finding an image? A few more minutes? Okay, so let me pause this for a second. Let me come around and help you with some images. So I have one frog that does not have a background, and it's a PNG, and I have one P-Bear that has a background, has a white background on it, and it's a JPEG file, JPG file. So I, I made my, I, okay, so I, I, met, I, sh I shortened the, the width by dragging and moving over my Xcode, because I want Xcode up, and I save these on my desktop, because I'm just going to throw them away after I drag them into the folder. Where we're going to put them, I'm just going to put them in the main first app folder. So if you just click on the, like I'm clicking on the frog and I'm dragging it over here. And you see where it says like a green plus next to it? I'm highlighting the main folder and I'm going to let go. And then I get a little dialog up. I'm going to copy, I like to copy the images into the folder because then when I move the folder the images go with it and I don't have to worry about it and I can just delete it off my desktop when I'm all done. So make sure on the destination on the top over here, it says copy item into destination groups folder if needed. <clears throat> and then under here, it says create groups of added, don't leave, just leave it alone. Okay, <laughs> just leave it on the create groups. And then click on finish. Now you see I have a frog over here, so I click on the, if I click on frog, it shows me my frog. So do it for both. I'm going to drag the, pear, the bear over here too. So I'm going to put the bear in here. And now that, because I, clicked on copy item, <coughs> I have that as my default, so it's always going to be checked. So go ahead and click on finished again, 
Now I have a pea bear. And see how I have a box around this bear? It's going to give me a slightly different image. In fact, I'm now going to, I'm probably going to put another button on there so I can see it. <clears throat> now if I look at that folder, remember that folder we have out here. If I double click on the folder and I go into the first app, now I see it copied in here. So I can remove these now from the desktop. I don't need them anymore. They're already been copied into the folder. If you don't copy them in, you remove them from the desktop, they get removed from the project. And that's such a good effect. So let's go ahead and put these buttons, excuse me, put these images on some buttons. So I'm going to actually have three now because I'm going to have one with text and now I have two images. So I'm going to go ahead and click on my storyboard again and uh, drag another button because I need another one. So I got two buttons. I'm going to leave this one here with the label just so you can see what it looks like. I'm going to click on the first button here and then over in the right hand side of the screen I'm going to change the where it says button. Right now it's a system button. A system button is a button that has text on it. You press the text. I hate the way the iOS 7 system buttons look. They're just, in the past they used to have like a border around them. They look like a button. Now they just look like text. You just press on the text. That's the system button. We don't want to do it. We want to make a custom button. So we're going to change system on the top to the type. We're going to change the type to custom. So now we have a custom button. And then if we go a little bit further down, we see where it says image. There's an image in here. So there's a little pull-down thing. If I click on the pull-down thing, where my mouse is right over here, you have to go down a little bit here. It's kind of hard to see it, maybe. That's why I'm kind of pausing on this right now. You see right under it says image. So I'm going to change it. I'm going to put my frog in. So I'm clicking on frog. And I see my big old frog now on the screen. So I'm going to make my frog a little smaller. I'm going to, because he's too big, I'm going to drag him this way. And I drag him, I see that the measurements of the frog are being shown. So right now I have 146 by 122. I'm going to make him like 50 by 50. Uh, or maybe I'll make him 80 by 80. Is there any... 81 by 81. Huh? Is there any place we can just give the size of the frog? You can. Over here on the right-hand side, you can type in the size of the frog. Um, well, where? Here we go. I have to click on it. Um, I don't use this side over here because I'm kind of lazy. Uh, I usually just use the mouse. I know that you can type it in, though. I'd have to look that up for you, actually. I just, I do it this way. I don't do it over here. But you can set the attribute. Very big. It's not showing Uh, let's, okay. Um, hold on one second. Let me show you a little trick about these images. Some of you picked really huge frogs, big frogs, two big frogs. And then they're like, when you put it on the canvas, it goes way off the canvas. So you want to keep your pictures on the smaller side. So if you click on the frog as an example, and you look over in the right-hand corner, and you click on, actually, you can see the dimensions right here. It says 256 by 256. That's actually kind of big. So if you got like 100, 150, think of more like icons. Because you're, you're going to put it on the canvas on a button that's going to be sort of an icon size. So something like 150 to 200 pixels by 200 pixels. If it's over 1,000, it's probably not. It, it'll, it'll work, but it's going to be a lot of trouble because you're going to have to resize the image. <coughs> um, a word on resizing images, by the way. If you have a picture, you can resize your picture. So if you have an image... I deleted my frogs, but let me just do this here. I'll pull the I'll pull one of these guys out. I'll pull this guy out. Uh, let me just copy him. Stick him on the desktop here. If I have an image and I want to resize the image because I really like it and I want to use it, double click on the image. It brings it up in preview. You see a little picture of it here? In preview, go to tools and then go to adjust size. You know, adjust size. <coughs> I can see this frog is 256 by 256. I'm gonna make him. I'm gonna make him smaller. I'm gonna type 50 by 50. So I'm gonna type 50 in here. And now he's smaller. <laughs> so if you want to resize your image, I go like 200, 250 is like 250. Maybe that's the max size, because then you're gonna lose some resolution. So if it's over a thousand, cut it in half, or two thirds, or a third. 
Okay. Does anyone need any more time right now? Okay, hold on. We'll give so you a few more minutes. Yeah. Again, add it to the stove yeah. Once you once you've resized your frog, yeah. come over here and delete the frog. How do you do that? Well, you just click on the delete key, and a little button comes up. It says remove reference or move to trash. Move it to trash if you're not going to use it, and then drag your new frog and put your new frog in there. If you originate, if you resize, if you resize the frog in the folder. Keep it. Don't move it to trash. <laughs> Just remove the reference. Yep. Uh, to resize the image, you click on, double click the image, brings it up in preview. I'll make this one bigger again. Go to tools, go to adjust size. My frog's now 50 50. I'm going to make him 200 by 200. <laughs> so I'm making him bigger now. Up oh, now, well now he's kind of blurry because I made him bigger. So it's sometimes safer to go smaller than it is to go bigger. So we'll take a few minutes while Joel is doing attendance. So let me pause this. Yeah. We're coming back to frogs and bears. Okay, so I'm going to assume at this point everyone's got their frogs and their bears and their images. I'm going to throw this one away. I just made him for he's junk. And you've copied them in, and I've copied them in. And we're going to put them on the buttons. So I don't know if I put, yeah, I put the frog out there. So I have a frog, and you can kind of see he's transparent. And for this button here, I'm going to put the, uh, my bear on there. So just refresh your memory if you haven't done it or you're still doing it on the type. Change the type to custom. Down here on the bottom where it says image, put the image on here. Now it's got a bear. See how the bear kind of doesn't look as good? And uh, some of you in, ended up with this problem, actually, when I click on the bear. This one's not too bad. But if it's really big, you don't see it. You just see this, like, a little box. Normally, you just see the upper left-hand corner box that will be on the canvas. If that happens, delete it. And then because what ends up happening is the box is too big. You'll never find the button. Can't find the button. I did this uh, to a couple of students, actually. You go and you click this little guy down here on the left-hand side. And you open up the side panel, and I can see I have two buttons. Actually, I have three buttons on here. I can click on the button as an example here and delete the button. I press press the delete key, and the, the button's gone. So to get rid of this, if I don't want this up here again, I can click on the side panel. I can leave this up. There's no problem. In fact, you know, it, it comes in handy. A lot of people like it because then they can come over here, and they can click on items and change the attributes over here if they want. But I don't like that. My style is put it away, so I just put it away. So I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, button back, and I'm going to put it back on custom, and I'm going to put the uh, bear in there this time. Oops, what did I put in there? P bear. Oh, my button got smaller. It's an interesting concept. Uh, so I'm going to make the button a little bit bigger this time, and uh, <clears throat> now I can sort of see the effects of what happened. So in a lot of cases, it's the image that's going to give you the visual effect. So a lot of people put images, it's kind of like web design, they put images with nice little like interesting button looking images, um, interesting stuff, makes it a little bit, uh, doesn't, you know, like this one looks like a button but the one below it doesn't. So, and you might notice when you move things around you get the vertical and the horizontal lines. If you're not getting that, you probably turned it off. So, um, the, the preference to turn it off, so. So anyway, everyone right now should have two labels and three buttons on their screen. And hopefully we're all set up. So now what I'm going to do is get rid of the side. I've made my user interface as ugly as it could possibly be probably. And so I'm going to go ahead and click over here and get rid of the side panel piece. Um, it makes gives me a little bit more room on the screen so I can see things. And now I'm going to click on this thing I call the tuxedo icon. So this little guy here looks like a tuxedo and uh, it's the code. So it brings up the code. And uh, if I put my mouse over here, the official word is called the assistant editor. Show the assistant editor. <clears throat> so I'm going to put this back into view so I can see it. And over here on the right hand side, I've got the code window up. Hopefully you're doing the same thing. We're going to switch the file over. The file by default, it says viewcontroller.m up here on the top. Click on it and then change it to .h. So it says viewcontroller.h. So we wire to the interface we implement in the implementation. 
The .h is the interface, the .m is the implementation. Both files together form the object. One's the interface, one's the implementation. If you take the objective C course, you'll get a lot more information than that on that. But uh, long story short, <coughs> we're, we're going to do what's called wiring. Everything that we put in both of these two files go in between at symbols. We have an at interface and then we have an at end. So everything goes in between. We have properties and then we have actions. Properties allow us to change characteristics about things. Hide, show, um, change the label. And we're probably going to want to change properties on the labels. So we're going to drag the two labels over as properties. So you click on the label, here is up here, and you hold down the control button on the keyboard. And you drag it, you press the left mouse button, and you drag it over and you get a blue line. The blue line is our connection line. And then press, just let go of everything, and the blue line goes away and we get a little pop-up box that shows up. So I'm going to call this one, yes? Uh, hold on a second. Yes, let me repeat this one more time. <laughs> so, this is viewcontroller.h. I'm clicking on the button, one of the labels, the label that I have called thing one, for holding down the control button, right mouse clicking on the left mouse button. Yeah, left mouse button. <laughs> and you just drag it. You hold down the button and you drag it over and you get a little blue line. You want the blue line. Get the blue line, just let go of everything. And then a little, a little screen pops up. It allows you to add something in here. What we want is the name. So I'm going to call this one thing one. So I got thing one. I'm going to call my label thing one. I'm going to leave it on weak. And I'm going to, this, this object type is a UI label. So it says UI label. And then storage where it says weak, it means it can be garbage collected. We have weak and we have strong. If I put it on strong, it never goes away. <coughs> what does that mean? It never gets garbage collected. When does it get garbage collected? Well, when my app closes, when the screen closes. If you leave it on weak, then you allow it to be more memory efficient. Because then you're just not going to create everything and not allow anything to go away. Which is what basically all that means. In fact, I'm surprised this is still on here. Because they're probably going to remove it eventually anyway. Why, why, everyone leaves it on weak. So... So go ahead and click uh, connect. When you connect it, you see a little ball over here. When I put my little mouse over the ball, <coughs> I get a plus symbol. And the plus symbol <coughs> shows me that it's connected to the label. So go ahead and do it again now for the second one. So I'm going to call my second one thing too. So I'm going to click on the second one, hold down the control button, <coughs> right drag it over to the .h file, let go of everything. And then call this one thing too. <clears throat> and then press connect. And then I have two properties. <clears throat> so it has an at property next to it. Have we made it that far? Do we need any do we need a few more minutes? Okay, so let me pause this for a second. Okay, we're back. Um, good question. These are called properties. So what is a property? A property is kind of like an attribute. Why do we make them? Why do they call them properties? I don't know. But we turn everything into properties so that we can change their settings. We can change the background color, the foreground color. And we put a label on the property. Uh, so the property is actually the data type. So it's not an integer. It's not a float. It's not a double. It's a property. And the property is thing one, thing two. So think of them more like variables. I think of them more like variables. That would work. And then the weak, as I had mentioned before, not atomic, don't worry about that. But the weak and the strong, weak says garbage collect me. If I'm weak, that means when I'm not being referenced and I'm not being used, I can be garbage collected. Strong, the option strong means never garbage collect me, always leave me around forever. Why do you want that? Well, if you're going to load something up into memory and you don't want that property to go away, you want that property to stay there for the life of your program, then you make it strong. Right now, we don't necessarily need to worry about that because we're just going to throw this thing away anyway. But and sometimes in development, we don't want it garbage collected. That's basically all it's saying. So think of this as two variables that we've declared. 
We have a pointer here. All objects in Objective-C are pointers. So without teaching you very much about Objective-C, because this is an iOS class, um, just know that you're going to see pointers, but the name of this object is Thing1 and Thing2, or the two objects. We put properties in the .h file. In the .m file, we synthesize them. So up here on the top, where it says ViewController.h, click on it and go to ViewController.m. In the ViewController.m file, you see an at implementation, space ViewController. Underneath the at implementation, it used to, Xcode used to do this for you automatically. Then they took it out. So now you have to do it yourself. And what do you have to do? Why, why, why do we want to synthesize? Well, I'm going to show you what this is and I'll talk about what it is. So if you type the at symbol, you get this. It comes up automatically. It says synthesize property. So if you just press return on synthesize property, we just put the two names in there. The two property names that we created were thing one and thing two. If I actually just start typing, I type in T. <clears throat> I see on the top where it says UI label thing one, thing two. I can press return. And I don't see the asterisk anymore. The asterisk is kind of like a pointer actually in C++, but you don't have to worry about pointer. It is a pointer actually. It creates a property a pointer. It gives it a name, thing one. And then what we're doing over here is we're adding them in a line that's called synthesize. So put them both in, thing one and thing two, and then put a semicolon at the end of the line. This goes in between the at implementation and the at end. I like to put the synthesizes up at the top. I like to put them right underneath the at implementation line. If I do that, I can find them. So what are we doing when we're synthesizing? In Objective-C, in Java, in C++, we have these things called setters and getters. <laughs> Synthesize creates the setters and getters. Why didn't they call them setters and getters? I don't know. So half the people in class are going, what are setters and getters? Okay, so the setters and the getters. In any, object, in any object oriented programming language, you have data, and then you have properties, well, data or properties, and then you have functions or methods, messages, that get worked with the data. The common messages or methods or functions that work with the data is to set the data or to get the data. So to set the data, if I have a property and the property was thing one, usually like the text on the data is going to be set. So by default on a UI label, synthesize gives me set text, get text, and I don't have to write any methods to do it. It's an automatic way of, what is that noise coming from? It's an automatic way of creating setters and getters. Um, unfortunately, I can't teach you programming or too much about programming, but set the property, get the property. But with the synthesize, you get everything, not just the text. I can set the background color, I can set the foreground color, I can change the image, I can do anything I want to that property. So synthesize gives me all the setters and the getters for all the possible property settings I could possibly do for a UI label. Not that many of them, but if I'm curious to see what those are, I click on the label, go back to the attribute inspector. Everything in this window, don't do this, don't do this, but everything over here in this window can be set programmatically now. Synthesize gave me that. So I no longer have to come back there and actually manually do it. I can do it inside of the code. OK, so now that I've created my setters and my getters for my thing one and my thing two, I'm also going to want to play around with the buttons. I have three buttons i got to wire. So I'm going to go back and click on the viewcontroller.m and change it over to the .h file. Now, I'm a little um, organized in the way I do things. I like to put all the properties on the top. And then I actually automatically add properties for buttons. You don't have to, but you can. There's a couple of things with a button. A button's got an action, button action, but it, it can also be a property. So let's make properties out of all of our buttons, and then let's make actions out of our row, because this is for practice anyway. That way we can change images, programmatically change images, or enable, or disable, or hide and show these buttons after we click on the buttons if we want, which will we'll do something. So go ahead and click on button number one, drag it over, make three more properties now with all three buttons. So button number one, button number two, and button number three. 
press down the control button and I'm going to call it button one. <clears throat> Actually, I think I'll spell it out, button one. And it's a UI button this time. So this might look familiar. Looks the same. It says storage week. I press connect and I see property. So I put all my properties up front. I put a space in. If you hadn't noticed, I put a little space in because then I can tell the buttons from the labels. <coughs> so I'm going to go button two now. Button two. And now I'm going to call this one button three. So just when you thought you were done having to do connections, <laughs> there's three more. So I'll give you a few minutes, make sure everyone's got their three buttons in there. Do we need more time? Or are we that fast? After you've done them a couple more times, it picks up a little bit. So now if I put my mouse over, I see all my properties are properly connected. One, two, three. Are we good or are we, do we need a few more minutes? Anyone need any more time? A couple more minutes? Uh, a question, difference? yes? Yeah. What's the difference between view controller.m and .m? Okay, so the view controller.h and the view controller.m are two files that work together that make the object. And the object that it makes is the view controller. The .h is the public interface file. That's why it says at interface. It gives us our public view, which are method prototypes, properties, things that we're <coughs> easily able to use as an interface. Then the .m is the implementation. It's generally the source code that makes the button work. It's the setting and changing of the different properties through the synthesize. In the old days, well, actually even in the current days, we have the public interface that gives us access to the private code. Everything in the .h is open to the public and visible. Everything in the .m is hidden. It's private. Which means you can protect your code interface and you give out a template or a, a .h specification. They call it a specification in C++. And if you know C++, actually the good parallel is it's like iostream.h or stdio.h the .h file, this is the same .h file by the way. It just has a bunch of method prototypes in there. When you do with that, you include it in your implementation and you use CNC out, printf, stuff like that. Well, you're not putting in all the code, it's pre it's pre-compiled object code that it's being linked to at compile time. That's a compiled language. This isn't, this is a compiled language, but this is a 100% dynamic language where C++ is a static language, which means you have pre they call those pre-compiled headers over in the C++ world. And they don't call them pre-compiled headers over here because nothing's pre-compiled. Nothing happens till runtime in Objective-C. So instead, it's the public interface to the private object code that's out there, available at runtime. We just pick it when we find it. Makes it more dynamic, changes more often. Okay, <clears throat> and in a, a couple of... Uh, you know, in fact, if you go over, to, you click on the .m file, at the top you see import view controller .h. This is actually the same as saying include. See, so when I typed in include, it wow, it works. You put a header file in there. Include and import are interesting. Um, and this makes sense, or makes sense for me to explain this right now because I just did the static dynamic thing. Include includes and puts in pre-compiled headers in statically compiled languages. So all statically compiled, this is your this is your trivia bit for today. All statically compiled languages use the word include. And the one most people are familiar with is C, C++, statically compiled language. It means that it links everything. Everything is included in the .exe file. What does that mean? It's not the, not the entire iostream.h, but if you used a method in there, or used a function in there, like c and c out, which actually would be a method, not a function, but if you use something, then that code is taken out of this object and it's put over here in this object, that exe file actually contains it. It's in there. You go to a, a uh, language like Java, you'll see import. You go to Objective-C, you see import, because we're 100% dynamic. Which means you get in Java you get dot class files. In Objective C you get dot O files. Well, you don't run the dot O file, it's all packaged up inside of the little dot at file for you. But long story short, it's the same concept. 
it's not, nothing is in there. The only thing in there is your code. Makes a very small file. Nice. Then you can upgrade the operating system. You can upgrade everything outside of the little small little file. Problem with statically compiled languages like C++, you gotta recompile that thing every single time you want to change something with iostream.h or in one of the system libraries changes you got to recompile your program because everything's inside of that exe file now people argue they say well they got dlls now yeah they fixed the problem with dlls dynamically linked libraries so you pull it out you're still working with a static language but you pull it out <clears throat> you got a dll and you link the dll in which is kind of the equivalent to an import kind of sorta but not the same it's not as efficient so <coughs> but long story short, <coughs> you can uh, do them both if you want. If I include bad practice, don't do it. If you include viewcontroller.h instead of importing, it's going to copy. You're going to have a bigger running app, bigger running, because it's going to copy the code and put it in there for you because you're going to include it inside of the running program instead of import it in at runtime. So you're making it static which is not such a good idea. Makes the executable bigger, doesn't change, doesn't you know, upgrade the OS. If you ever had one of those apps where you upgraded your OS but the app looked different, like the app never changed because they put everything inside of it. And so the MF, the, 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 the Windows and everything, oh, the whole thing looks like an old app. <laughs> Probably is an old app. <laughs> so it's got old code in there. It's not being upgraded. It's not using anything dynamically. It's not adapting. Okay. Um, so I'm going to bet on that. So let's go back because we're not done yet. Let's go back to the viewcontroller.h file. <coughs> so I still have viewcontroller.h out here. Now we're going to create, I have the three buttons and I have the three labels, uh, two labels. Now we're going to create three actions. So the three actions we're going to create, we're going to do that by right mouse clicking on the button. So select a button. Here's button number one. Click on the right mouse button. You want this little screen to come up. If the screen doesn't come up, you're setting a property, not an action. So you see on the top it says button, button one. And then down here on the bottom it says referencing outlets. It says button one. This was the reference we made. This is the property reference. So it's that's set correctly, we're good. So <clears throat> where it says sent events. In the center of the window here, we have did end on exit, editing changed, touch down, touch up, up and side. Let's just pick, because we're going to use the emulator. It doesn't really matter how we're going to touch the thing. We're just going to put our mouse on it. They all work. It doesn't really matter which one we use. So I'm going to go ahead and just press touch down. And I'm going to go over here to the right of touch down. It doesn't really matter which one you use. Click on it. You don't have to actually press the control button now. You just click on it. And you see it kind of goes away a little bit. You see this blue thing coming now. I've got the little blue line going. And then it says insert action. If you let go, you got a lot of little button that comes up. So now I'm going to put thing uh, button one click. So I'm going to call this one click. Because this is when you click the button. So I'm going to call it button one click. And underneath it, it says the type. Remember we had UI buttons and we had UI labels and stuff. This one says ID. ID is a generic data type in Objective-C. ID means it's anything. I don't like ID because then when I look at it, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I like to actually tell the code what it is. So I like to pull it off of ID. If you leave it on ID, you can just go, oh, okay, just use it, whatever it is. But we're not really going to do that. We're actually going to use like a button. So I'm going to click on the little arrow and it says, well, if it's not ID, then you can make it a UI button. Well, it is a UI button, so I'm going to make it a UI button. So I'm going to select UI button. And then on the event, this is the touchdown event. If you don't like it, I, I clicked it over here. So I clicked the wrong one. And I say, oh, I didn't want that one. I wanted another one. I could click it and I can actually select it here as well. I can change it. I'm just going to leave it on touchdown, though. And then on the argument, <coughs> the argument's the sender. You're like, okay, what's a sender? In object orientation, messages send messages, excuse me, objects send messages to each other. The sender of the object is the person who's sending the message. Like, you know, return address <laughs> on an envelope is the sender. 
who sent me this? You look at the envelope. The UI button sent me this, or B Hecker, Barbara sent me this thing on the return. It's the return address. The sender, the person who's sending me this message, and I'm the view controller, in this particular case is the UI button. And it's not only any UI button, it's the button one click is the sender. So that's where that sender kind of terminology comes into place. But go ahead and press connect. And then now I see a button here that says IB action. IB action, button one clicked, colon, UI button, asterisk, which is the data type, actually. It's a UI button, sender. But the button is called button, the action is called button one clicked. If you got one done, you can do the other three. So you'll notice over here, this does not close automatically. You've got to close it manually. So I'm going to go ahead and close it. So there's a couple little things we can do. Let, let's go ahead and wire them separately. And then when we're all done, we'll put two to the same action, just so you can sort of see what happens. <coughs> Excuse me. Actually, we'll leave them separate today. So go ahead and do the one for the, for the frog. You can actually, if you want to, you can wire all of the different ones if you want to. This is button two, so button two uh, clicked. Change the ID to UI button, press connect, and then right mouse click on the purple bear here, and I got I got here button three, button three, click UI button control. <laughs> I'm going to assume we need a few more minutes. Am I correct? No? We're good? Wow, you guys are faster than... You guys are picking it up? You guys are getting bored? <coughs> Anyone need a few more minutes? Okay, I think that's what I thought. Let me pause. Okay, so we got our buttons wired. <coughs> and we have our properties. So I'm not going to synthesize the properties. I just wanted to show you the properties on the buttons because, well, we might synthesize them, but we'll just, that's part two of this. So go ahead and click now over to viewcontroller.m and scroll down to the bottom and you'll see something really nice. You see the methods, this is why I said don't change it because it automatically puts in the method bodies for you in the .m. So for each one of the method prototypes or outlet prototypes that we dragged over there. So in the synthesize, we have to put this in manually. In the old days, it did it for us automatically. Now it doesn't. I don't know why. Because it does this for us automatically. So on the IB actions, those were method prototypes. These are the method implementations. So you see we have at implementation up here. So we're going to write the functionality to implement what we want for the, uh, for the items. So when we click button number one, <coughs> well, we got three buttons and only two labels. It doesn't really matter. We can have it. We can have it do different things. When we click the buttons, we're going to change the labels just so we can see something happen. So go ahead and put some space in between button one click here. We're going to open it up. So this is button number one. When we click button number one, I'm going to have thing one, which was my label number one. I called thing one. I'm going to have that first thing change to say button number one was clicked, something like that. So messages, what I'm going to do is send a message. So the sender is the button. It's going to say, hey, send a message to that label and change the, la to change the label. So messages are sent inside of opening and closing brackets that look like that. So you can put the opening and closing brackets in, or you can just start out with an opening bracket. If you start out with an opening bracket, Xcode will try to fill things some, some stuff in for you. So the first thing we do is we give it the object name that we want to send them. We're going to try and send a message. So we give it the object name we're going to send. We're going to send it to thing one. So I'm going to start typing in thing one and I get I get this automatically comes out. So I'm going to select thing one. So I'm sending a message to thing one. And what do I want to send to thing one? I want to set text. So we have set text and we have text. Why didn't they have set text and a get text? I don't know. The set text and text. And text says get the text. Well, give me the text or set the text. We want to set the text. So I'm going to put a space in here. I'm going to type in S. 
And the first thing comes up, this is the great part about Xcode as an IDE, actually, the autocomplete for you. It's really set text, and then it's set text with a string. So what string do I want to put in there? Well, I have to tell, I have to create this string. The easy way to create this string is to use an at directive, which is that at symbol. The at symbol says, this is a string. Kind of stupid. Was, once, you, once you get familiar with how to how to work with the code, this is not this is easier than C It's like you just have these like little message exchange kind of thing going on. So if you put an at symbol in here, then you say, oh look, I can do string. I'm creating an NS string. So I just press return and I got the string body. And what's the string I want to put in here? I'm going to put in here button one, button one, pressed. And then I have my closing um, parenthesis, and then I have to close the bra I have to close the message sending. So I put the closing bracket in, and then I put a semicolon at the end. And then I have a proper method. And the method is thing one. Yeah, what do you want? Uh, set your text to button one pressed. Okay. <laughs> so I sent a message to set text to an object. Is what I did with this. Pretty easy. No. So let's have uh, button number two and button number three. I'm going to take the cheat sheet method. Now I'm just going to copy this. <laughs> copy and paste. So I'm going to copy it because I'm really writing the same piece of code. So on button number two clicked, I'm going to paste this guy in here. And I'm going to change thing one now because I called it thing one. I'm going to call it thing two. I'm going to say button two pressed. Or actually, button two is the frog, so I'm going to say frog, frog pressed. And then I'm going to put the bear pressed in here. So paste. This is thing three. <coughs> and I'll put in here purple bear, purple bear pressed. And I misspelled three. Now, see, I notice I misspelled. Uh, let me misspell it again. I don't have three. You're right. I, I uh, let's go put back the thing one. You're right. Okay, actually, here. Well, actually, you're right, and you're right. And this is a good way of explaining what happens when you have an error message. The interesting thing is, uh, this is an error message because we don't have thing three. There's no. We only have two labels. We have three buttons and two labels. So if I put my mouse over this red little ugly little thing over here. And or excuse me, I click on it. Put my mouse over. It says use undeclared identifier thing three. So you click on the red ball, and it tells you what the error message is. And the particular error message is and this is an error message. Anything in yellow is a warning. Anything in red is an error message. So, oh yeah, okay. So there's no thing three. Well, that's a no-brainer. So let's just make this one thing two. We have a thing two, or we can add a thing three if we want. What happened with my thing too? Oh, I misspelled thing too. Okay, good. <coughs> so now that I have my buttons working, I sort of want to see this thing work. So I'm going to run it to see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and press up here in the left-hand side. Or do we need to wait? Well, I'm going to run mine, and then I'll come around and help anyone who's still having problems. You don't actually have to save it. When you run it, it saves it for you. So in good practice, after you make some significant code changes, it's not a bad idea to run it. We're not quite done with this yet, but I want to run it just to see it. So up here on the left-hand side, I have it on iPhone Retina 3.5 inch. And if I press on the little button, the arrow, I have an upgraded version of Xcode, and they brought back the itsy bitsy little emulator instead of the big ugly one that I was complaining about. Oops, but now I got the I got the little I don't get the little one. I got the big one. My screen comes up, and I press on button one. It says button one pressed, and then I press on the frog, and it says the frog pressed, and then I press on the the purple button, and I say the purple because I changed thing thing two. And each one of the buttons should still continue, well, to change. So all three of your buttons should work. And then I've noticed an error. I'm looking at my beer, on my purple button, and I see the word button up here that I don't like. So that's because I left the label on there. 
So I'm gonna I can do two of the one of two things to close the simulator. I can close it from the iOS simulator up here, and that would actually close it. Or I could press this little square button here that would stop the running of the app, but leave the emulator up there. So the emulator is still out there. If I'm low on memory, I can remove the emulator. I have a lot of memory. I don't really need it. I'm just going to leave the memory uh, emulator up there. But now I'm going to click on my purple button and fix that little problem. I'm going to pull the label off over here under where it says title. So now the label's gone. So now when I run it, I should get a newer version of it, one with a button missing. So it says purple bear, frog pressed, and button one. So let me pause this for a second and see if everybody's here so far. Okay, a couple of little things I noticed while walking around. Um, the emulator will show up behind Xcode by default. So if I shut the Xcode, if I shut the emulator down, let me show you something real quick here. If your screen comes up and it's blank, make sure you're running the right emulator. So on the left hand side over here, I had, it says iPhone Retina 3.5. If you've got it on iPad, but you've made an iPhone, it's going to be blank. It's going to be a big old white I iPad screen that came up because you didn't give it an iPad interface. You only gave it an iPhone one. When you run it, nothing's going to happen. Why? Because it's hidden. It's hidden behind Xcode. So there's two things you can do. If you click on it, if you move it and click on it, the next time you run it, it will come in front of Xcode, like mine just did a few minutes ago. If you don't see it, come down here. You'll see it over here. This is the simulator. I call it an emulator. It's really called a simulator. But you'll see it in the taskbar. So you just click on it here, and if it's behind Xcode, it'll bring it forward. So it'll be in front of you. So let me pause again. Okay, we're back. Somebody asked me. Or do you have a question? Okay, we're not back. Hold on a second. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. Uh, there was a couple of little things that people did uh, that was actually kind of interesting. If you click over here, you put what's called a breakpoint in. If you have a breakpoint in, this one just happened actually a few minutes ago, and the uh, app runs and it stops and nothing comes up on the screen, it's because things stopped. This causes your app to go to a certain point and then stop. So if you do that, you're going to have a problem. The other thing that uh, some people did is they... Uh, they changed, oops, I don't know what I just did there. Uh, they changed things after you dragged. So here's, here's, there's a small, small little problem with Xcode in that when you, when you click and you, you drag over here and you wire it, and then you change code over here, like you change this here, the name of the item, be very careful. The most critical part is to fill that little box in correctly because there's a small little bug, and it's not really a bug, it's a problem scenario. Let me describe what happens to it. All this stuff gets cached in memory. So Xcode tries to like pre-cache definitions of things. When you wire it, it caches the name. Then you go and change the name. And it has the old name in the memory. And so you have to clean the project. If, you, if that's the case, you go up to project and you go clean or you go build. You reboot the computer. A couple days later, you bring it up and it finally works. <laughs> because it finally cleared itself out. And uh, it's a delayed refresh of a cache. So once you wire, as a general rule, I never change the name. Even if you misspell it, just leave it alone. Because what ends up happening is one little minor change and you messed up the cache memory on it because there's no way of automatically resyncing it. It's gotten better, actually. But if you might notice, you might actually notice something interesting. And I noticed it earlier on somebody else's. They misspelled something up here or they had to... Actually, it was over here. They put the, the brackets in, but then it didn't mark it up there. It's because it's cat the system is being cached. It doesn't find it immediately. Like there's an error and you leave it there. And then all of a sudden it comes and you, oh there's an error now. It wasn't an error before. Where'd the error come from? This the system isn't synced um, in real time. There's a little delay to it. And that delay gets that 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 causes a scenario in which you do stuff and weird things happen. So I don't know if it's a really a bug. It's more of a understanding that the system is a little behind you. It's not quite as up-to-date as you are. So when you start changing stuff, it confuses itself. Okay. <clears throat> and another person asked, I said, well, what's the purpose of this app? There really isn't any. It's hello world. <laughs> so, um, and because there's no purpose, let's go add something else to it to make it even less purposeful. Um, what we're going to do now is going to put a, put a text box in here. 
So we'll put another label that says enter your name or something. We'll put a text box. But you know what? I think I'm going to put the text box on the top because I'm going to show you something. Uh, so I'm going to move my buttons down on the bottom. I'm going to put my label here, label here. You know what? I'm going to put another label on here too because I want to be able to um, put a little prompt up here. So if this side has closed already, you click on the right hand side over here, open up the side window again. And I'm going to put another label up here. And uh, this is just going to be a little prompt I'm going to drag up here. It's going to say, enter your name. Enter your name. There we go. And uh, there we go. And then underneath it, in my little search box down here, I'm going to write text, T-E-X-T. -E and then I get a text field. So I'm going to drag the text field over here. And I'm going to open it up, make it a little bit bigger. Because I'm going to add my name, or I'm going to type my name in here. And then when I press return in the text field, I'm going to have it change a label. So I have thing one, <coughs> excuse me, I have thing one, thing two. I'm going to put thing, I'm going to actually put another label on here. I'm going to put th thing three on here again. I mean, because I'm running out of, I'm running out of output boxes. So I'm going to type in label here. And I'm going to put another one. I'm gonna, this one's going to be, I guess I could have called it label, but I'm going to call it thing three. So I'm finally going to get my thing three. Uh, so I'm going to make this one bigger. And I think I put this text on 25. I'm going kind of fast here. You don't actually have to do this, but if you want, what we're going to do is kind of extend out the behavior a little bit. So I added an extra label for my things. I put one up here, and I have a text box. So I'm going to close my side window. I'll give you guys a few minutes to catch up in a few seconds, but hopefully you're doing this. And I'm going <clears> to <throat> come back over and I'm going to add this stuff to my viewcontroller.h file. So I'm going to make sure I'm on the .h file. And up here at the top, I have choices. I could put it underneath. I can, I can add in anywhere I want to add. So I'm going to put my thing 3 next to my thing 1 and my thing 2. So I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so it roll, it's all in one line now. So I'm going to take my thing 3, I'm going to press the control button, and I'm going to drag it over here, and I'm going to put in here thing 3, and leave it on UI label and press connect. So now I have thing 1, thing 2, and three, thing 3, and uh, I'm going to go and click on the viewcontroller.m while I'm remembering, and add it to my synthesize line as well, and take out that breakpoint there. I'm just going to put a comma at the end here and say thing three. Now let me show you something in here a little bit different because this is just hello world and we're just practicing right now. We can have more than one synthesize line. So there's a school of people that want to do this. They want to go at synthesize and then go, let's say, for example, thing three. So I put thing one and thing two on one line and then I have thing three on another line. I'm sorry? Thing. Thing. Th yeah, thring. I'm sorry. Thing. Thing. Three. On another line. <laughs> thank you. I'm like, what, is, what does that mean? <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> or I can go thing one, thing two. What I like to do is group them by things or group them by items. I know all these are labels. So I put them together in kind of a logical order so I remember what's what. Just like I group things together, and I'm just kind of showing you a, a kind of best practices kind of way of doing something. So there's no need no need to do this. But if I had other things like a text field, I could synthesize it down in a different line and synthesize it differently. So um, in fact, I'm going to have a text field. So I'm going to leave this alone right now. I'm going to go back to the .h file. I'm not going to synthesize enter your name because I'm not going to use it for anything, which is the reason why I kind of I put that out there just to show you an example. I don't have to make a property. I don't have to make a synthesize out of it. I can just leave it there. There's no need. I'm not even going to use it for anything. But I am going to use this text field. So I'm going to drag the text field over just like I dragged the labels over. So I'm going to press the control button and I'm going to put it underneath and I'm going to let go. I'm going to call this one 
uh, name text or name field. I got to call it name field. F I E L D, and it's a UI text field. So it says UI text field underneath it, and it's a name field. And I'm going to press connect. Now, because it's a UI text field, it's different than my labels, right? Well, it's the same thing. It's a property. You see how I have all these properties up here? If I come back over here to the .m, if I really wanted to differentiate it, I would put thing 3 over here, and then I'd put my name field here. This I see a lot of people do this. So I got all my labels, my UI labels on one synthesized line, and I got my name field on another, my, my text field on another line. If you want, you could do it that way. Otherwise, you could just put them all on one line. It doesn't really matter. Yeah? Uh, you never synthesize buttons. You don't have to. Um, well, actually, you can synthesize a button. We, we made properties out of those buttons. Hold on one second. See these properties? We didn't synthesize them because we weren't using them. We don't have to synthesize them. But if we wanted to, or I say button 1, button 2, button 3, I could do this. I could come over here and say, at synth and I would create a different line out of it. At synthesize and go button 1, button 2, or button 3. Now I can change those buttons. So what does synthesize mean? The question was asked. Let me refresh your memory. <coughs> synthesize allows us to change the properties. It gives us our setters and our getters, as I mentioned before. What a setters and a getters is a lame, layman's way of saying um, the built-in methods that you get to modify the property from a public interface. Properties are private, and synthesize is public. So the implementation of it means that now we can change the label, or we can hide it, or we can show it, or we can do something to it. So a quick and easy way, kind of seeing how this works, is I've added, and I'll take a slight detour here, because well, some people are still, some people are still wiring in thing three and the text, or maybe they're not, maybe you've given up, uh, but. Over here where I synthesize a button 1, button 2, button 3, I can actually get at it now as a property. So over here, let's say for example, um, this one here, this is my button. It says button 1 on it. This is my button label here. I could act on that button. As an example, I could open up another um, message, start another message. So I put an opening bracket, and I can type in the name of the button. As an example, it was like button, uh, this was button 1. And I can say, um, you know, like, uh, hidden. Here's it. Well, I know hidden. Uh, I'm trying to say, um, button one dot hidden as a property. And I can say true. Uh, and I don't need to, I don't need to do that. Actually, I can do it this way. Um, so for those of you for those of you who are familiar with C++ and Java as an object oriented language and I'm just kind of I want to kind of introduce to you the multiple ways of writing the syntax as well today. The way we write it in objective C is like that. We write a message to set text get text or text. We can also do this way. That looks familiar to C++ and Java people. So this is a property. So button one is this button over here. Dot hidden is the dot notation. That's like to set a property. If I had a person and it had a first name and a last name, and I had a person Mary, I can go Mary dot first name, Mary dot last name, and I can set first name and last name. Well, what I've done here is I said <coughs> hidden is a Boolean property. It goes true or false. So actually, if I make hidden false. If I run this button, this is button number one, when I click on button one because I put it in the button click method, it's going to change thing one label to say button one pressed. And watch what's going to happen when I click the button. It goes away. It's hidden now because I set the property of the button to be hidden. So You don't have to do that. I just put that in there to show you. But this is not Objective-C looking syntax. It doesn't work for everything. It's kind of limited, but it does work for this case. 
and this is C++ syntax, so I'll put a little note here. What I'm going to do is post this solution along with the video. <laughs> so you have, for those people who did not get this to work, those people have errors and problems, you can use this one because I'm going to zip this up and put it underneath the video. You can download it and run it on your, your system. Everything's inside of it. All the images and everything are inside of the file. So I'm going to put in here C++ style as a note here. <coughs> And then this one here is uh, Objective-C style. All right, so we have C++ style, Objective-C style programming. Okay, so going back up, a little side tangent, going back up to the text field, when we type something in the text field, on the exit of it, after we press the return, we're done. So we have a keyboard that comes up when we type in. In fact, if we run it right now, we're going to get the keyboard automatically. Let me show you what happens when we run it right now. <clears throat> I had it up there a few minutes ago. I should have just left it up here. So if I click in here, i got a keyboard that shows up on the bottom. I'm going to type in, um, well, what's my name? Barbara. And I press return. And I go, nothing's happening when I press return on my keyboard. Oh, okay, I'm going to just press return here. Get rid of my keyboard. Keyboard, go away. Keyboard's not going away. Keyboard's messing up my buttons on the bottom here. Nothing's happening. So let's fix the behavior, because we didn't do anything. I just dragged it and stuck it on there. I haven't really done anything. Okay, so when we're done, I'm going to take what's in the text field and put it on a label. How's that sound? That sounds pretty good. Um, so I'm going to click on over here this attribute, the attribute inspector on the side, and I'm going to click on the text field. I'm going to move this out a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about. And... Uh, I'm going to come over here to the right, scroll down to the bottom, and it says where return key. I'm going to say done. Here's done. The return key signals done, and done's an event. How do you know that? You just have to kind of work with me here in terms of the functionality. How do people learn any of this stuff? Oh, they read books, or they go online, and they go, how do you get the keyboard to go away? I don't know. Program a done re event. And if I program a done event when I'm done, I can do something with it. Right? All right, so I set the return key to done. Now I'm going to close the side piece here. You, can, you don't necessarily have to follow along right now. You can just, so you just watch me if you want, because some people are, are burnt out at this point. Um, I'm going to switch this back to the .h file. And underneath here, I'm going to put an action in for my text field. So I added my text field property. I already have that gone. I put the property in. I did synthesize. So I'm now going to right click on this text field. And I'm going to see one here. It says, did end on exit. Did it end? Well, I said it done, which means it ended. So the return key, when I press the return key on the keyboard, it sends done. Done's end. So that's really what that means. So the event is did end on exit. So I'm going to go ahead and you know, put this over here and wire this event. You might notice I also have these other events I can choose from. The same events for the button. So when I put my finger in there, I touch in there, I do all the other stuff, then, oh well, hey, you know, something can happen. But I don't want to do that. I just want when the, when the person types in their name, presses return, this is what's going to happen. So this is an example of how you program the behavior. So I'm going to put in here name entered name entered and I'm going to change the ID to a UI text field <coughs> and press connect. When I change the ID to UI text field I see UI text field show up in here. Um, so the reason why I've been changing it is because otherwise this would say ID. And what do these guys say? This guy's instead of UI button it would say ID. ID. So what's the difference between button, one click ID and name entered ID? They're all ID. I can't tell the difference between what they are. So that's why I always change it from ID to whatever it is. Um, and I can always change it back to ID. ID is interchangeable. So anyway, so now I have name entered. And so I'm going to get the same thing if I go over to the .m file. I'm going to have another method here. Just like my buttons, I have another method. So now I'm going to take the text from the, from the name, uh, whatever I called that thing, can't remember what I called it right now, um, Then uh, and put it on a label. So I'm going to start the message by asking the label. 
So I'm going to say label. Well, which one? Let's put it on label number three, the new label that we created. So then I'm going to open it up and send my message. I'm going to say uh, label. No, what did I call it? Thing. I called it thing. Thing three. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I'm going to say set text. That's what we just looked at a few minutes ago. But instead of giving it a string, I'm going to give it the property. What's the property? It's the text of the UI text field. What did I remember what I called that UI text field? I don't know. So I come up here and I go, it's called name field. Okay, so I go name field, name field, and I go dot. What I really want is the text, so dot text. And now you can see I've got a combo going on here. I just took the property C++ style. <laughs> so because I use the dot, I, I call it C++ style because I it's really I used a dot notation on a property. If you're familiar with object-oriented programming, you know properties or data members and member functions or the this is a this is the function. So I just did a C++ dot notation and just got the property. So in essence, I could ask for name space text if I wanted to and do it with different syntax. So now, um, now so thing three is now going to be equal to whatever I did. Now there's a little trick here to resign the first responder. I may have showed this to you before, I may not have, but on the key, to get the keyboard to go away, on the object we have sender and we have a responder. The sender is the object, so this object sending a message to another object. Like the UI label sends a message to the view controller and back and forth. And I'm sending a message. I'm the sender. I'm the view controller, and I'm sending a message to this label. The responder is who responds to the message. Hold on one second. I just want to finish this thought. Say that one more time. I didn't have to deconstruct an object. This object. Oh, I'm sorry. You mean this name field object? Okay. The name field object is the text field. I dragged a text field, UI text field, I put it over here, and then I wired the text field. In a few minutes, I'm, at the end, I'll come around and help you. But I wired the text field over here, it's called the UI text field, and I called it name field. And the property got, I got the property when I synthesized it. All of a sudden, now I have set text, get text, I got everything. I got the property automatically when I synthesized it. So over here, I can go dot text, and I got it. I got everything that comes with that UI text field. Now in the sender responder scenario, we've seen sender, let's see responder. Responder, if you put your tech, if you put your finger on a button, the first responder is a button touch. It's a touch control or gesture control. It's something that the system itself responds to. It says, oh, take the event. What's the event? It's a click. It's a touch down. It's a touch up inside. It's one of those touch events that we did. It picks out what it is and it responds by running the method. And the method that we have in here, we put I put on button touchdown, I think, touchdown events. So if you have an event, the responder, the first responder, they call it a first responder, the first responder is the activity that's associated with the action you did. So when you press your finger into a text field, the first responder is the keyboard. The first thing that comes up is the keyboard. So there's a little trick you do. It's not really a trick. It's programming. And you say, resign the first responder. Oh. <laughs> resign means go resign. You know, resign. Here's my letter of resignation. Go away. No more keyboard. So we just tell, we send a message to the text box to resign your first responder, please. It's in my way. So I'm going to run it without the resign first responder. Actually, I have to resign the first responder. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to see the button or see the label. So underneath where I've set the text, don't worry if you haven't gotten this part. I know it's kind of a long meeting. I'm going to put the name of the text field in here, which is called name field. And I'm going to type in resign first responder. Oops. Resign first responder. So name text is the name of this UI text field. And I'm telling, I'm the view controller, and I'm telling the UI text field, resign your first responder. 
your first responder is a keyboard. Because that's the first thing that happens when I am I'm the GUI, I'm out there, I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to this event. It's a text field, you're gonna type something, right? I'm gonna put the keyboard up. If you're a button, I'm gonna do something else. If you're a gesture, I'm gonna do something else. So this dissipate this makes the keyboard go away. This grabs the text and this is combo. It's actually a combo unit. It takes the property of the text that's in the text field, UI text field, and puts it on the label, the third label. So I'm going to try it out and see if it works. So I press the um, arrow over here to run it. And momentarily, <coughs> I'm going to type in here. <coughs> and now my first responder is the keyboard. Keyboard came out. Remember, the keyboard wasn't going away last time. I'm going to type in here Barbara, and I'm going to press return. I resigned the first responder, and lo and behold, Barbara is now on the label of thing three. So thing three now has Barbara on the label, and the responder went away. If I type back in, the responder's back. I'm going to change it now. I'm going to put, hey, from the class. And now I got, hey, from the class over here. And I still got this functionality going. I got button one, button one went away. I got the frog going on. I got the bear going on. But I hid this. I could put another button and bring it back. So I can come over here and say, let's say on the on the purple bear, the purple bear is going to bring back. Let's bring back the other button. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to say button one uh, dot hidden is now going to be equal to false. So I put button one hidden. So button number three is going to bring button number one back. So now I'm going to run it. And I'm going to see, hopefully. Oops, where's button number three? Here he is down. Well, I have to take button number one away. And then button number three brings it back. Here's that button number one. Away, back, away, back, away, back. <laughs> so, we have kind of made our hello, we actually finished our hello world. This is as far as I wanted to go, actually. And uh, next week is a holiday. Next week is Martin Luther King's birthday. I don't want you to lose everything. You've, all the progress you've made so far. <laughs> and you got to go, what progress? And I'm going to go, practice makes perfect. That's how you make progress. How are you going to do it? You have to do it. That's what you got to do. So here's my suggestion for what I would want you to do. Take and uh, start with a brand new project. Make stuff work. I showed you how to use a text field. I showed you how to use buttons, and I showed you how to use labels and taking buttons and putting stuff on labels. My suggestion is to experiment. See if you can go above and beyond. See if you can see 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 what you can do in terms of changing properties. Hide things, show things, change the background color, change the foreground color. And then when you get bored, you can optionally come over to the behacker.com website and I'm giving you homework to do to get so you don't I don't lose you in the next week because I'm not going to see you for another week because we don't have class next Monday. <coughs> so you go into spring 2014, you go into iOS application development, and then you can come into where it's called example projects. If you get bored, you get bored on your own and you go, oh man, I've done all this stuff. I've done everything I could possibly do. Then take a look at this tutorial. This is my next suggestion, the GUI controls tutorial. It's the first tutorial. Um, over on project one, project two, these are, this is .doc files. So actually here, let me just save these so I can tell you what this is about. And then I'll show you this one here. Um, <clears throat> practice with GUI controls is a good one to do. We're going to build the calculator in two weeks. So I'm actually, this is, we're actually going to start with a calculator, which is a lot of buttons and a lot of math and a lot of, not a math, but 
And next week, not next week, because next week's a holiday, but the following class meeting, we're going to work with data, data types, taking data, manipulating data, which is our calculator program, building applications, building our true applications. We're going to make a big jump. So the finished project of the practice with GUI controls, let me save this one here. Uh, I just downloaded it. If you open it up and you take a look at it, let me just show you the finished project so you know what, I'm, what it is we're looking at. It's nothing too advanced. It's a build from scratch from a tutorial. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a little screen, too. Uh, let me change the simulator so I can see it. It's kind of small, <laughs> but there's a green button, a yellow button, a blue button, and then you type something in here. Uh, Hello there. You press return and it changes the label. It's just if, if you if you get stuck and you can't do this was the tutorial. I didn't we didn't do this tutorial, but if you get stuck on your own, because you don't have any instructions to follow, that's the solution for the project that is called Hello. The project is called Practice with GUI Controls Tutorial. So what we're doing this week is practicing with the GUI controls. If we can get that little minimum stuff down for next time, then we can build a calculator. Because then when I drag all the buttons over, then I'm going to show you some stuff like wiring a bunch of buttons together into one function. And then we make baby steps and we build more functionality and then we actually get working apps that I mean, this is a working app. It's not doing very much. It's just playing with GUI controls. So, as I mentioned before, I'll be putting this video out on YouTube. <coughs> In the um, comments section below the video, I'll put the zip file of the finished project. And the finished project is this guy here is called First App. It doesn't really do anything. But if you didn't get yours working, you don't have to start over from scratch. You can take a look at this one. I play around with it. I've had some people actually do some really cool stuff with it. You can, um, I don't know, put make get pictures of cards. When you click on the cards, it randomly puts up another card. And you figure out, how do I do that? And then go online and say, well, how do you get random to work? You know, And experiment, explore, experiment, get practice, get comfortable. <coughs> Excuse me. So that next time we come in, I, and I'll do it in a few minutes. I'll come around and help you. But next time we come in, we have fewer and fewer people that need to, like, how do we, how do we control drag? How do I make a property? How do I make a synthesize? So I want you to be able to be comfortable. Hold on a second. The timing, my voice goes at the end. Um, I want you to feel comfortable making properties, making synthesize, making I <coughs> IB actions, and changing uh, characteristics and properties of GUI components. So if you can get comfortable with the GUI, then you get faster at it and you get more proficient at it and you'll be able to wire and make everything work. So that's your homework for the next two weeks. So I'm not going to see you next week, but I'll see you the following week. <coughs> I'm going to stop this recording because I can't talk anymore.